Yes, the ark is here in Acts. Since the time it has departed from Jerusalem and has rested in Aksum, it is still in Aksum. Do you yourself believe it is there? I wholeheartedly believe, not only I, but all believers of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Ethiopia, the source of the great Blue Nile, a mystery solved 200 years ago, but Ethiopia may now be the setting of an even greater mystery. The fame of King Solomon reached the ear of the famous Ethiopian Queen of Sheba. What touched her heart was not the wealth but that he was a wise man and his wisdom was from above. Legend in Ethiopia has it that the Queen of Sheba traveled to King Solomon, that they fell in love and had a son. His name was Menelik, first emperor of Ethiopia. And King Solomon so loved this son that he let him have Israel's most sacred possession, the Ark of the Covenant. And that is how this holiest of relics, symbol of the bond between God and his chosen people, passed with Menelik from Israel to Ethiopia. Outside Ethiopia, this legend has always been subject of ridicule. The Bible leaves no doubt that the Ark remained at the temple in Jerusalem for centuries after King Solomon. Menelik, if ever he existed, simply could not have carried the Ark to Ethiopia. The dates don't fit. The belief that the Ark is in Ethiopia forms the very core of religion in that country. Yet, scientists locate the land of Sheba in southern Arabia. The Queen of Sheba was not Ethiopian, she was an Arab. The legend of Menelik and the Ark cannot be more than a charming bit of folklore at its best. And yet, whatever happened to the Ark, holding the Ten Commandments which God gave to Moses, over which hovered the presence of the Lord as it led the Jews to their promised land, the embodiment of God which brought down the enemies of Israel and for which Solomon built the Temple of Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant, symbol of the bond between God and Israel, lost without trace. The greatest mystery of the Bible, perhaps the greatest mystery of all human history, this priceless object in which the presence of God was believed to reside, emanating supernatural powers, the focus of worship in the early Judaic religion from which all the other great religions of the world, world spring, that it should go missing. This was what fascinated me, that it, that it should vanish without a trace, without mention in the scriptures, without lament, that it should just go. It seemed to me impossible that this should be the case. There had to be a story behind it. There had to be a truth there to uncover, and that's why I was attracted to it. Graham Hancock, author, correspondent for The Economist. As an Africa specialist, Hancock had been fascinated by the Ethiopian legend for many years. Like everybody else, he had found no truth in it. Yet, on a few days off in France, an event occurred which led to a string of new discoveries. It all began with a little restaurant on Chartres Cathedral Square. Dites-moi, s'il vous plaît, excuse, uh, dites-moi, s'il vous plaît, uh, pourquoi cette restaurant s'appelle la Reine de Saba C'est de rapport à la cathédrale avec euh, le portail du Nord, vous avez la statuette euh, de la Reine de Saba. Ah, oui. 
Queen of Sheba has always been thought of as an Arabian figure. Even today, scholars associate her with Sabia, with South Arabia. But here in Chartres Cathedral, amazingly, is corroboration of the Ethiopian claim to the Queen of Sheba, a statue of the Queen of Sheba set unmistakably in an African context with an Ethiopian figure at her feet. And when I saw that, it brought back to me all my early work in Ethiopia, the conviction that there was a real mystery, an ancient mystery in that country associated with the Queen of Sheba. And more exciting still, here I find very close to the statue of the Queen of Sheba an image of the Ark of the Covenant and a strange inscription, Hika Mikitur, here is, here is hidden. It's, it's obscure and ambiguous, but it contains the possibility of the Ark being concealed in the land of the Queen of Sheba and of that land being Ethiopia. It's brought to mind strange ceremonies and years of research into the Ethiopian legend. Hancock had allowed himself to be dissuaded by the conventional wisdom of scholars. Now, this chance discovery in Chartres brought back the desire to renew his quest for the lost Ark of the Covenant. So why should we find this echo of the Ethiopian tradition in a Christian church in northern Europe dating from the 12th century. It, it seemed to me extremely puzzling, unless in some way those who built the north porch of Chartres Cathedral had had contact with Ethiopia and perhaps had learned something about the Ethiopian tradition that impressed them enough to go to the trouble to build these sculptures. Chartres Cathedral was born in that surge of zeal which brought the Crusades, the conquest of the Holy Land, and also a discovery of the Arab world and the achievements of the ancients. Out of Chartres sprang a new school of thought and building, Gothic architecture. At its birth stood a proud and mysterious order, the Knights Templar, vanguard of a century of surprising creativity. A siècle riche, a siècle inventif, a siècle qui ose qu'on n'oublie pas que c'est le siècle où l'on développe par exemple la cartographie. On sait aller jusqu'à Jérusalem avec des cartes terrestres. Un des enseignants, Bernard de Chartres, écrit « Si nous avons quelques connaissances aujourd'hui, il ne faut pas oublier que nous sommes comme des nains montés sur les épaules des géants. The secret longing of that age is voiced in a book describing a quest to the unknown outer marches of the world, Wolfram von Eschenbach's Parsifal and the Quest for the Holy Grail. It reaches out to some central mystery and religion, and it bears the stamp of the Knights Templar. It's practically under the eyes of these Templars and these secretaries that the Quest for the Graal, Perceval de Gallois, has been conceived and redigated. Scholars have not ceased studying the meaning of the Parsifal of Eschenbach, overlooking strange echoes of Africa which shake Hancock, an expert of the continent. Here we have a, a searcher for the Grail riding deep into Africa, past the Rojas. Now many scholars have thought that Roja in this context referred to somewhere in Europe, but I know for a fact that Roja is the ancient name, a long forgotten name for an ancient capital of Ethiopia now known as Lalibela. This exciting discovery in Wolfram von Essenbach turned my mind back to a mystery that had puzzled me years before, the incredible phenomenon of the rock-hewn churches of Lalibela, churches carved out of solid rock on a gigantic scale conceived in the mind of a master architect. And there were legends that these churches had been built by white men. Could those white men have been Templars? Look, here on this roof, the double cross of the Knights Templar. This discovery came as a revelation for me. It drew me to Jerusalem, where in the 12th century, the Templars began their quest for the central mystery of the High Middle Ages. For some, it was the Holy Grail. Others speak of hidden treasure. For me, 
It's one object, the Ark of the Covenant. It was here in Jerusalem in the 12th century that the Knights Templar had their headquarters. They based themselves right behind me in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which they made their palace. And they built this porch, they added it on to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And we can see in this porch the first flowering of the style of Gothic architecture that achieved its full fruition in Chartres Cathedral. A new departure in building and a new departure in human thought, engineered, originating with the Knights Templar. Everything about them is uh, mysterious. They seem to come from nowhere. In the early 1100s, a group of nine rather obscure knights goes to Jerusalem, manages to get itself established upon the Temple Mount, takes full control of the Temple Mount, doesn't allow anybody else in there. They were searching for the Ark. There could be no more precious religious relic than the Ark of the Covenant. If they could acquire the Ark, and bring it back to Europe, then their ambitions to achieve power, secular power, would be fulfilled. With this object in their hands, they would be absolutely unstoppable. One of the strongest Jewish traditions has it that the Ark of the Covenant is buried somewhere here in the caverns and tunnels that lie beneath the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount itself, for centuries, has been a political minefield, impossible for archaeologists to work beneath. But in one period, the Crusader period, when the Templars, the Knights Templar, were in occupation of the Temple Mount, they used that opportunity to dig beneath the Temple Mount in search of the Ark of the Covenant, I believe. Suddenly, they stopped. It's as though they learned some new information. The Church of Ethiopia has always maintained a small monastery in Jerusalem. At the time of the Templars, a young prince saw refuge here from Ethiopia. His name was Lalibela. No, not all good and tired. Lalibela fled from rivals to the throne of Ethiopia. He was an exile in Jerusalem for over 20 years. Scholars have overlooked the significance of his stay. For the Templars, the young prince must have had exciting information. Lalibela fled to Jerusalem with only few. Twenty years later, he went back with many to reclaim his throne in Ethiopia. What I've managed to reconstruct is that a meeting did take place between the Templars and this future king, Lalibela. And at that meeting, Lalibela informed the Templars that the Ark of the Covenant was in his country, in Ethiopia. And I believe a deal was done. They wanted the Ark. He wanted to become king of Ethiopia. They were a powerful military order. He said to them, put me back on my throne, and I will give you access to this object. And I think that's what happened. Scholars mostly ignore this fact, nor did they give attention to another fact. At the time of Lalibela's return to Ethiopia, Crusader knights fit out a small fleet at Aqaba. It sails the Red Sea and is destroyed attacking Muslim ships of Mecca. But could it have gone a little further, carrying Lalibela back to the throne of Ethiopia? The Templar evidence for me, uh, it played a crucial role in my own quest. Uh, it, it made me confident that there was much, much more to the Ethiopian claim to possess the Ark than the scholars were ever prepared to admit. But I was confronted by a real problem. The story of Menelik bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Ethiopia could not be true. Therefore, if the Ark had got to Ethiopia, what I needed to find out was the real historical process that had brought it there there had to be an explanation, and that's what I set myself to find. The Bible doesn't write about the stunning disappearance of its most sacred relic. It shrouds the fact in mystery. Jewish tradition has it that the Ark was secretly hidden to preserve it from the armies of Assyria and Babylon, but one scholar blames the king of Israel itself. 
It disappeared at the time of Manasseh, which in a such an, an exceptional chapter in the history of the First Temple period. Manasseh was a pagan ruler. He simply introduced an image of Asherah, which is a Canaanite um, image idol into the temple. Both of them, the Asherah and the Ark, couldn't stand together. It was a problem of either or. The priests of Jerusalem would not allow such a thing, nor the prophets, for instance, nor the people at large. It is remarked in the text of Manasseh that he shed very much blood to such an extent that he filled up, filled up Jerusalem with innocent blood. Innocent blood is an epithet for the blood of the prophets. Apparently the popular prophets were, who tried to defend the ancient religion of the Judeans. Now, even this is hinted at in three or four words at most. And as I said, uh, the occasion was so repelling for the writers that they couldn't dwell upon it. You feel it. They save words. They, they speak of it only briefly. When you come to ask them, those writers of the Bible, why Jerusalem was destroyed, the answer is precisely because of the sins of Manasseh. In years following Manasseh, the prophet Jeremiah laments the loss of the ark and the coming doom of Israel. Soon after come the armies of Assyria and Babylon. In the tunnels and caverns of the Temple Mount, Jews lament the fall of Jerusalem the destruction of the first and second temple. But hardly anyone knows of the existence of another temple in ancient times, a third temple built by refugees from Manasseh's persecutions who took their cue from a verse in the scriptures. There will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar near its border. And taking its cue from this verse, in the time when the King Manasseh paganized the temple in Jerusalem, a group of disaffected priests fled to Egypt and set up a replacement temple at Elephantine. The island of Elephantine. For over a century, it had housed the colony of Jewish soldiers mercenaries paid by the pharaohs to guard Egypt's southern border. The site has been excavated by German archaeologists. The first sensation was that during the 100th century, papyri on Elephantine were found, which from a Jewish community in southern Egypt on Elephantine reported. The second sensation bestand darin, dass in den Texten ein jüdischer Tempel im Stadtgebiet erwähnt wird, ganz ähnlich wie der Tempel in Jerusalem. Dieser Tempel durfte eigentlich nicht sein. The best bet for the site of the Jewish temple is just over there, underneath that rubble of thousands of years. What we're seeing there are the remains of the Temple of Knum that was extended on top of the Jewish Temple, but that's where the Jewish Temple lay. And over here, very close to it, we see the, inhab the habitations of the Jewish military colony, which uh, extended down here and along the edge of this hillside here. It's a theological puzzle that this temple was ever built. In that period, which was a period of 
extremely hardline religion. There were no other Jewish temples anywhere in the world. The whole concept of Judaism was focused upon the temple and upon the ark. Therefore, for another temple to be built only becomes comprehensible if that temple was built to house the ark, and that's exactly what I believe happened. How long did the ark remain here, in your opinion? In my opinion, the ark remained here from 650 BC, the time of Manasseh, until 410 BC, when this Jewish temple on Elephantine was completely destroyed. Egypt has come under foreign sway. The Jewish priests and mercenaries are now in the pay of the King of Kings of Persia and hated for it by the Egyptians. On Elephantine itself reigns Chnum, a ram-headed god. Only a stone's throw from where the Egyptians worship this mummy of a ram as their god Chnum, the Jews worship their god Yahweh with blood offerings of bulls and rams, angering the priests of Chnum. When Egypt rises against Persian rule, they seize their opportunity. The Jewish temple is destroyed and the Jews of Elephantine are forced to flee. Their only way is to the south, not to the north, back into Israel, for there a hostile Egypt blocks the way. But moreover, a welcome back in Israel is no longer certain, for Israel itself has changed dramatically. I believe that uh, the Jewish faith based in Jerusalem had evolved during the centuries of the absence of the Ark from Jerusalem. We have to remember the Ark is taken out of Jerusalem during the First Temple period and brought to Elephantine in 650 BC, certainly according to the way that I reconstructed. What happened after that, another 70 years later, was that the First Temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and the Jews were carted off into exile in Babylon. There they began to worship an incorporeal deity, a deity who had no physical presence in any one place, but who was everywhere, intangible and omnipotent. During this period of exile in Babylon, the Jewish religion evolved into the kind of religion that it has become today. And I believe that it was only here on Elephantine, where the Ark remains secure, that the old form of the Jewish religion was maintained. So. For the Ark to come back to Jerusalem at this time, in 410 BC, would have created further conflicts with the established, between the established priesthood in Jerusalem and the established priesthood here. So all the motivations point to a journey to the south, not north through a hostile Egypt to a Jerusalem that no longer wanted the Ark, but south, south towards Ethiopia, following the Nile River system, away from these burning deserts, and into the green highlands of Ethiopia around Lake Tana. Holy Lake Tana. Jews from Egypt arrived here deep into the heart of Africa, perhaps to join others who came centuries earlier in the company of Menelik, the legendary son of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. In Lake Tana, a small island, Tana Kirkos. This is uh, a Christian country and a, and, and a Christian island, but they have a powerful ancient memory of a time when they were Jews and when they conducted blood sacrifice. On Tana Cherkos, they told me that the Ark of the Covenant had rested for 800 years, that when it was first brought to Ethiopia, it had been brought to that specific island and placed there for safekeeping. That it had been the focus of worship for a people who at that time were entirely Jewish and that for 800 years it had remained the focus of their worship. And they showed me altars that had stood before the Ark of the Covenant in front of it where the blood of the sacrifice had been poured. Suddenly all the gaps were bridged. <laughs>
ስፍራውን ታውት የነበረበት ይሄ ነው ይያል ማባፈቻችን የሚያስረዱን the ark stood before these sacrificial stones and the sacrifice was carried out in a certain way and the way that they demonstrate the scattering of the blood is exactly in accord with old testament jewish traditions it's the it's described in fact in the the mishnah and it's quite uh, inconceivable that this christian monk here on this island has ever read mishnah so he's passing down to us a very pure ancient tradition of jewish blood sacrifice before the ark of the covenant in the presence of the ark of the covenant on this island and although the Ark of the Covenant was taken away perhaps 1600 years ago to Aksum where it rests today, its presence is still felt here. For me, I, I feel a very strange sensation of, of the Ark of the Covenant having stamped its, its power and its energy on this island and on these ancient rocks. The dawn of Christianity ends the worship of the Ark at Anakirkos. Ethiopia's new Christian kings wrestle it from the Jews and take it elsewhere. Ethiopia belongs to Christianity. And nowhere is the victory of Christianity as clear as it is here, a town of holy churches built differently from all others in Ethiopia. Inside, they sometimes remind one of medieval Europe. Outside, they bear no comparison to anything at all. Its ancient name was Roha, until an exiled prince returning to claim the throne of Ethiopia named it after himself Lalibela. Churches rested out of stony slopes and hewn in one piece out of solid rock. In a forecourt, a priest recites a prayer for the dried out corpses of those who dared eat the bread of Holy Communion. Lalibela flourished at the time of the Crusades, of the Templars. Some centuries later, Portuguese travelers speak of legends about white people helping build the churches. This church is, is dedicated to the Virgin Mary, and, and that is not an accident because the Virgin Mary was a figure of great significance to the Templars, and this church was built by the Knights Templar, and it is full of mementos and memories of the Templars. Look here, we find the Croix Pate. The, the cross of the Templars, and, and here, up above, set in a, in a star of David, also a seal of Solomon, a perfect <coughs> Templar cross, painted red as the crosses of the Templars were painted 800 years ago. The whole place is full of these memories, and if we come around here, we find something quite remarkable. If I'm not mistaken, what we see up here is an image of the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. And strangely, spectacularly, it bears on its domes crosses. There was only one period in history when the Al-Aqsa Mosque was decorated with crosses, and that was the period of the Templar occupation in the 12th century. If this proof may be refuted, the next one may not. Legend has it that Jesus Christ himself appeared to instruct King Lalibela how to build this church. He leaned against this pillar, and therefore it is wrapped in shrouds shielding it from curious eyes forever. Is it possible for me to see it? Could you at least tell me what is written there behind the cloth? Sator, Rotas. These words Sator and Rotas were of special significance to the Templars. They form an anagram, in fact. They read the same in reverse. And uh, we find these words on a Templar property at Gizors in France. The exact words of the Templar cryptogram are these Sator, Sador, Arepo, Alado, Tenet, Danat, Opera, Abera, Rotas, and Rodas. All words can be reversed both fore and backwards, both horizontally and vertically. The words of Tenet form a cross and mean in Latin, it is held, and rearranged. The letters twice form the Latin words of Pater Noster, our father, with an A and an O left over, Alpha and Omega, the names of God indeed. Medieval crusaders penetrating deep into Africa, a fact which so far was totally ignored. 
These are the dungeons of a castle overlooking Axum, the town of the Holy Ark of the Covenant. It's another Templar cross, down here in the, down here in the darkness, a perfect croquette. My feeling is the Templars took over this old castle and used it as their headquarters here in Axum and uh, left us these memories of themselves. It could be on the end of a, of, of a tomb, it could be a tomb, it could be... There's an intriguing eyewitness report from an Armenian geographer named Abu Salah, a report dated to 1207. Abu Salah visited Axum. He gives us, in fact, the only eyewitness report of the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia, and what he tells us is amazing. I hate them. I hate bats. Oh, look at those evil little buggers. <laughs> yeah, they just pissed on my face. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> he tells us that the Ark of the Covenant was carried in procession by men who were white in complexion with red and blonde hair. No Ethiopians look like that. Those men who carried the Ark in procession in Axum were the Templars. Eight hundred years ago, they came for this, the great ceremony of Timkat, that one day in January when crowds in Holy Axum await the coming of the Ark. Attending Timkat in Axum is like making a journey through time. The dance of David before the Ark of the Covenant that is described in, in detail in the Old Testament is replicated in full life. The antiphonal chanting, passing voices back and forwards, all of this plunges us back into the Old Testament world. Ancient symbols of an empire which once ruled all of Ethiopia and beyond and brought the Ark here from Tanakirkos at the dawn of Christianity. For ages, they have looked down upon the coming of the Ark. No one has ever seen or touched the Ark in Axum. Not even the patriarchs, the highest in authority, have ever had the right to penetrate the holiest of holies and see what's truly there. As with the ancient Jews, that right belongs to one man only, the guardian of the Ark. There is a priest designated to eat from generation to generation. Because I am a patriarch, or my predecessors, because they were patriarchs, they don't have the right to demand or to overcome the command of God. How was he designated? because of his dedication, submission to God, simplicity. Whoever God chooses him to be, the guardian of the ark is. This little chapel in Axum houses the ark and Tesfa Mariam, its guardian, the only man who is allowed to see and touch it and is condemned to always stay next to it Never may he distance himself from it. Walking in the footsteps of Moses and Aaron, Tesfa Mariam still stands in awe for the ark he has to guard. Nasa <laughs> Nero. On the festival of Timkat, from every one of Ethiopia's 20,000 churches, replicas symbolizing the Ark are brought out in procession. But here in Aksum, this casket, wrapped in a costly veil, is believed by many to be the true Ark. Yet, Tesfa Mariam is not among the priests participating. The guardian of the Ark remains within the Holy of Holies, as if the real Ark has not come out at all.
Lit candles on a piece of wood are pushed before the casket into the water. If it floats, the year will bring prosperity, relief from famine and hardship. Thousands ring the basin known as the bath of the Queen of Sheba. As a priest blesses the water, there is one magic moment when silence falls and flocks of doves appear from nowhere to circle the water. Still floating, the blessing is received. For a few precious minutes, the water is considered holy, and the crowds surge forward to draw some of it, whilst boys defy the orders of the priests, prohibiting anyone from swimming. For the night, the casket rests in a tent, and as in the days of Moses, the people guard the tabernacle and fill the night with prayers. The uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church is literally unique in the world. There's nothing else quite like it. And it's a very pure and simple form of religion in its own way. I hesitate to say this, but almost paganistic in its uh, reversion to the worship of the Ark of the Covenant. Paganistic, but filled with a powerful belief in God and the presence of God hovering over Ethiopia itself, brought there by the Ark of the Covenant. It's the unshakable belief of the Ethiopians that the Ark of the Covenant, the embodiment of God, is here in Aksum. There was a time when I dismissed this idea as preposterous, along with everyone else in the West. But a small incident during a vacation in Chartres led me to a string of discoveries which now convinced me that the Ethiopian claim is true and that the Ark indeed survived here through many centuries of turmoil. One thing's certain, however, it's not this casket wrapped in veils now being carried back into the sanctuary. That's just a replica. It must be. For Tess for Mariam, the guardian of the Ark, never participated in the procession. All that time, he stayed here at the chapel, guarding what really remained behind, the holiest relic of antiquity, which it is his sacred duty to protect and from which he may never be separated. I'll never know for sure if it is the real Ark. No one ever will. Only he knows, the guardian of the Ark, keeper of a mystery which must remain concealed. For myself, I no longer have any need to penetrate the veils of that mystery. I know the Ark is there. <laughs>